This is the first part of Economics for Business, Lecture 9, entitled Bank Deposit Creation and the Quantity Theory of Credit. In addition to viewing this video, it would be worth uh, reading the articles that I have pr produced for the Economics Network. Uh, the first article, and the most central to this lecture, is the Credit Creation Theory of Banking article. Uh, which discusses the credit creation theory of banking, which is discussed in this lecture. You may also find useful the quantity theory of credit article that I have also placed on the Economics Network. In particular, there is a section, Financial Deregulation, which considers the elements of financial deregulation that occurred in the United Kingdom during the 1980s. So this video discusses the bank deposits multiplier and the credit creation theory of banking. The second video will consider the quantity theory of credit. The first point to note is that cash produced by the central bank for the state accounts for only 3% of the money that is in circulation. Of this 3%, banknotes account for 94% of the total, such as 5, 10, 20 pound notes, and coins account for the remaining 6% of cash in circulation. Whereas 97% of the money in the UK economy was created by commercial banks and not the Bank of England. So the primary form of money in the economy is not physical cash created by the state, but the liabilities of private commercial banks, which are often referred to as credit money, because the money only exists while the bank remains solvent. If the bank was to fail, then the money would disappear from the economy. This chart presents the information that I've just mentioned. So you can see that the blue bar at the bottom of the chart represents notes and coins in circulation that are produced by the state. And they are almost invisible, the bar is so small. Whereas commercial bank deposits, the pink area in the graph, comprises most of sterling M4, which is a measure of broad money that includes bank deposits. We can see here um, the way that money supply has, a, has expanded relative to gross domestic product. The blue bar represents gross domestic product sometimes referred to as GDP. Um, gross domestic product uh, measures the total expenditure on goods, new goods and services in the UK economy over a period of time, which is normally one year, but in this case the data is quarterly, so it's looking at uh, GDP over three months. If we increased that fourfold, we would get the approximate annual GDP figure. So you can see that GDP um, was 500 billion uh, pounds in May 2019. Um, that's 500 billion, 500,000 million, or half a trillion that has been spent in the UK economy on new goods and services in the quarter May 2019. Um, if we increase this fourfold, uh, we get an approximate figure for annual GDP. So increase 500 billion fourfold, that means that annual GDP will be approx approximately two trillion pounds. You will also see the red line 
on this chart, which represents broad money uh, in, in circulation in the UK economy, uh, more specifically sterling M4 liabilities. And for the period 1963 to 1984, it was a fairly constant uh, in relation to GDP. Um, money uh, in circulation was around twice GDP, uh, more specifically between 63 and 84, 1984, it was around 184% for most of that period. Um, so not quite twice the level of GDP. Um, it increased to 200% in the early 70s and then went back to around 184% uh, in the late 70s. But you will see a significant expansion of money supply relative to GDP after 1984. And by May 2019, um, the total money stock at 2,500 billion was five times the gross domestic product of the economy. Um, and you may ask why there was such a significant divergence between the amount of money in the economy and GDP following 1984. And the answer is that, um, to a large part, the it is a consequence of an increasing proportion of money being used to purchase previously owned goods um, that are not new goods and services and so are therefore not included in GDP, gross domestic product. So just to recap on a couple of terms I mentioned there. So first of all, gross domestic product, also referred to as GDP, which measures the total amount of money spent in an economy on new goods and services. In addition, uh, GDP can also be measured using the total value added created by businesses within a country, uh, because the total expenditure also equals the amount of value added created by businesses. And of course, also that equals the total incomes earned in a country because all the value added created by businesses is then distributed by the business to the factors of production that help the business create the added value. And so the firm, the business pays workers' wages, it pays interest to the providers of capital, uh, it provides dividends and profits to its shareholders, and anyone who has rented property to the firm um, and land will be paid rent um, in, in response. So there are three ways of measuring GDP which produce the same outcome, the same result. Um, you can measure GDP um, by looking at expenditure on new goods and services, by looking at value added created by business, or incomes earned by the various factors of production, land, labour, capital and enterprise. And all those measures of GDP produce the same result. As I mentioned earlier, 1984 money supply started to diverge significantly from GDP and that was following a period of banking deregulation by the British government in the early to mid 1980s and to gain um, an explanation of the elements that comprise UK government banking deregulation um, take a look at the section of my Quantity Theory of Credit article that discusses financial deregulation in the United Kingdom. And just to reiterate that the reason for the divergence between money supply and GDP is that an increasing proportion of the money being used in the UK economy 
is being used to purchase previously owned assets that are being sold by their previous owners within secondary markets. Examples of this include property which is being sold by the current owner through an estate agent. Um, that, will, that transaction will require money, but it is not a new good uh, or service and so will not be included in GDP. Similarly, um, an investor that has previously purchased financial assets such as company shares or corporate or government bonds may wish to sell those shares or bonds uh, through a stockbroker um, and will receive money for the transaction. But again, those shares or bonds are, non, are not newly created and so will not form part of gross domestic product. So I've shown an increase in money supply, a significant increase in money supply, especially since 1984. And the other side of the coin of rapid growth in bank deposits is a rapid increase in private sector debt. It's the other side of the coin. Private sector debt has increased from 50% of national income in 1950 to 170% in 2006. And Adair Turner, in his book Between Debt and the Devil, believes a considerable amount of private sector debt is the reason why economic growth since the 2008 financial crisis has been so limited, has been so anemic. And you can see in this figure the rapid growth in debt, uh, household debts, um, up to 2006. There's been a slight fall in household debt since then, but the fall is not significant, and so household debt is still very high. So this lecture will consider primarily two important theories for explaining how banks create new deposits and how they create new money. Um, the first theory is the one you will find in traditional textbooks, which is the bank deposits multiplier. Um, the second theory is the credit creation theory of banking, uh, which is discussed in my article on the Economics Network entitled The Credit Creation Theory of Banking. Um, the economics profession do not agree um, on how banks create new money. And so these are two contending perspectives on how banks create money. I will first discuss the bank deposits multiplier. And the first proposition of the bank deposits multiplier is that the banking system is a fractional reserve banking system. Uh, and that means that banks only keep a fraction of the money they receive in reserve or liquid asset for depositors to withdraw as cash uh, when required uh, immediately or at short notice. The majority of money is loaned out by banks to borrowers. And so it is worth understanding that banks only survive by making a profit and the profit arises from the bank lending money to borrowers at a higher interest rate than they pay to depositors. The difference between the rate they pay depositors and the interest charged to borrowers um, is the bank's profit. So they will aim to lend out as large a proportion of the money deposited with the bank as possible in order to earn interest from borrowers that exceeds the interest paid to depositors. However, 
banks need to maintain a proportion of their assets in liquid form so that they can pay repay the depositors their money when they come to the bank. Um, if the bank didn't repay the depositors, the depositors would likely feel that the banks were not financially solvent and so would all seek to rush to withdraw their money from the bank and that would lead to um, a run on the bank which would create a financial crisis. So the banks want to ensure they have sufficient liquid assets to meet the demands of depositors to withdraw their cash. And liquid assets take various forms. The most liquid asset is cash. So the bank will seek to keep some cash back so that it can quickly pay depositors the, the money they want when the depositor comes to the bank to acquire their money back. Um, however, there are other types of liquid asset which can rapidly be turned back into cash um, quickly and without financial penalty. And these types of liquid assets would include uh, treasury bills, uh, which are basically government debt. There is a significant market uh, for treasury bills. There is significant liquidity in that market. There is significant volumes of um, treasury bills traded. And so the bank keeps those knowing those are close to being liquid assets. Also, short-term government bonds are another form of liquid assets because of the liquidity, the volume uh, of trading in a government uh, bond market. Um, so in addition to cash, banks keep treasury bills and short-dated government stock as further liquid assets. Um, which can be turned into cash at short notice. The next proposition of the bank deposits multiplier is that banks do not create new money, but the banking system does. And I will explain that statement uh, more in the next slide. The further proposition uh, of the bank deposits multiplier is that there is a chain of deposit creation. And so there is this chain involves, let's say that there is an injection in the economy uh, of, of two pounds. And so this goes into the bank and the bank um, uses the money to loan a proportion of the money to a, a borrower. Um, in order to make their money. Um, and that borrower then uses the money to make a transaction which leads to a payment to uh, the other party to the transaction. And the re recipient of the money then deposits the money in their bank account, which may be different from the original bank. So this is where the banking system creates new money but the individual bank doesn't because money is moving between different banks. And so the uh, recipient's bank receives money and then they keep a proportion of that money in liquid form for any depositors wishing to withdraw the money and the rest is loaned out in new loans in order to make the, make the bank profit. And this process continues um, as the money is uh, moves between bank accounts. So you can see that process presented here, uh, an injection of two pounds initially, um, which is then spent by the recipient and um, is, is, is received by the other party to the transaction who then deposits the money into their deposit account and so there's a bank deposit of two pounds. Now, assuming that the liquidity ratio is 20% or one fifth, then the bank will retain as liquid assets one pound in every five it receives if the liquidity ratio is 20%. Uh, and it will lend out the other four pounds in every five. 
Um, and so we can see that with a bank deposit of two pounds, the bank will retain 20% as cash or liquid assets. So that's 40 pence will be retained and the rest will be loaned out to a borrower. So one pound 60 will be advanced to a borrower. Um, and that borrower will then use the money for a transaction. Uh, the recipient of the money will place the £1.60 in their uh, bank account. Um, the, the, this is another bank to the original bank. Um, and so this is where the banking system can create um, deposits, but individual banks don't. Um, so this other bank then out of the one pound sixty, it sets thirty two pence aside as cash and sh liquid assets, so it can easily pay depositors when depositors come in to withdraw their cash and the remaining one pound twenty eight is loaned out to a borrower to the bank and so that process continues. The borrower uh, is borrowing money to complete a transaction. the recipient of the money from the transaction then places the money into their deposit account in a, another bank, £1.28, and that bank keeps 20% to one side in cash and liquid assets, 26 pence, and lends out the other £1.2p um, to a, a borrower. Um, and so you can see that that initial £2 injection into the banking system, by the end of the process, uh, has created £9.91. Uh, but actually, this is not quite the end of the process. The actual amount that is, will, will be created at the end of the process is £10. Um, and that can be calculated using the bank deposits multiplier, which is the inverse of the liquidity ratio. So in this example, with a liquidity ratio of 20% or one-fifth, then the bank deposits multiplier is 5 over 1, or the inverse of 1 fifth. Uh, so the bank deposits multiplier is 5, and so therefore a £2 injection of a new bank deposit will ultimately create 5 times that amount. So 5 times £2 is, is £10. So there's a bank deposits multiplier, so the banks multiply deposits and that is what produces new money in the economy. So just to review key terms, liquidity ratio. A bank maintains a proportion of customer balances in liquid form in order to meet expected customer demand for cash. If it doesn't have sufficient cash to meet customers' demands for cash when when the depositor wants the money, it could lead to a run on the bank as customers, depositors might think the uh, bank is short of cash and unable to repay. So it's important for the bank to maintain sufficient liquid assets to meet customer requirements. A liquid asset is an asset that can easily and quickly be converted into cash with no risk of financial loss. The most liquid asset is cash, but assets that are close to being cash um, are treasury bills uh, and government stock, um, which are both government debt. Um, the government debt market is very deep. Um, there is a very large volume of uh, business um, and prices tend to be stable, so there is no risk of loss. The government will look to maintain some uh, government bonds rather than all cash because cash doesn't generate any return, whereas government bonds and treasury bills do produce some return for the bank, some interest, um, which the bank can get on its liquid assets. So the liquid asset ratio is determined by the bank, uh, which assesses what proportion of customer balances are likely to de be demanded by depositors uh, on demand or at short notice. And it uses those expectations of likely customer requirements for cash to determine its liquid asset ratio. 
Um, the liquid asset ratio can also be influenced by the central bank's minimum liquidity ratio. The central bank may decide that the bank should keep a certain proportion in liquid assets. Uh, but the central bank, the Bank of England and the UK, has had very little uh, influence, has sought very little control over banks' liquid asset ratio since banking deregulation occurred uh, in the mid-1980s. And the liquidity ratio is important because the amount of money that banks have to set aside in cash determines how much money uh, commercial private banks can create by lending out the money they receive from depositors to borrowers. So that is the bank deposits multiplier. And now I'd like to discuss the credit creation theory of banking, which is has a very different approach to considering how banks create new money. So the credit creation theory of banking states that banks do not solely lend out money that has been deposited with the bank, but the actual act of bank lending creates bank deposits. So credit money is created when a bank generates a bank deposit that is a consequence of fulfilling a loan agreement extending an overdraft facility or purchasing assets. In creating credit, banks simultaneously create deposits in our bank accounts, which are to all intents and purposes money. And the act of bank lending, therefore, by creating new deposits, new money, creates new purchasing power that did not previously exist within the economy. And the process is explained in the Bank of England Quarterly Bulletin uh, regarding how banks create new money, which I've hyperlinked in this PowerPoint presentation and is also explained in my credit creation theory article that is contained on the Economics Network. Therefore, the credit creation theory of banking proposes that the amount of money a bank can create is not constrained by their deposit taking activities. It is not constrained by the amount of money they receive from depositors because the bank can create new deposits uh, from nothing out of thin air at the stroke of a banker's pen or more usually in the 21st century by putting uh, numbers into a computer screen uh, in the bank's IT system. So therefore, because banks can create bank deposits out of thin air, those bank deposits are basically an IOU from the commercial bank to the economy that they will pay this money that has been created. So the money, these bank deposits, are sometimes referred to as credit money uh, because um, the majority of bank deposits were originally created by banks issuing new loans. And the money only exists whilst the bank remains solvent, able to fulfill the IOU. If a bank fails then uh, and becomes insolvent, then money is lost from the economy. So the bank's ability to create deposits means that individual banks can create credit money according to the credit creation theory of banking. So key terms. Credit money is a consequence of the bank creating a bank deposit which is not a result of a customer previously depositing money with the bank and so therefore it is effectively a bank IOU to the economy and that only exists that IOU whilst the bank remains solvent if the bank fails goes bankrupt then money is lost from the economy 
uh, bankruptcy of a bank destroys a significant proportion, if not all, of the credit money created by a bank. And so the government guarantees the first £85,000 of an individual's bank deposits in a bank account through the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. So we can say that the first £85,000 in a person's bank account is money because it is guaranteed by the government. However, any money saved that the deposit has above 85000 uh, is dependent on uh, the bank remaining solvent. Um, given that the banks create a deposit when issuing a loan, when the borrower repays the loan, when the existing debt is repaid, money is destroyed. The money no longer exists. So, in a sense, the economy doesn't want debt to be repaid because that destroys money in the economy. So, how can banks create new money out of nothing at the stroke of a banker's pen by putting numbers into a computer. What is the process that allows them to do that? Um, there are various elements that enable banks to create bank deposits. First of all, most transactions in the economy do not involve cash. 95% of all transactions in the economy are non-cash transactions. So, for example, when you make a transaction, um, you are likely to use a credit card, a debit card, or even your phone to transfer the money to complete the transaction. 95% of all transactions in the economy are conducted uh, are non-cash transactions such as electronic transactions. Um, uh, cash transactions account for less than 5% of all transactions in the economy. So, money is transferred electronically between bank accounts. 95% of transactions involve uh, non-cash transactions. And the banks are the accountant of record in keeping a ledger of who's getting the money, where money is being taken from. So the banks transfer money between people's bank accounts and act as the accountant of record. And so therefore, no one notices whether the money that is placed into their bank account by the bank is money that has actually been saved and deposited with the bank or whether it is money that has been created by the bank. So individuals don't notice uh, that the bank is creating money because the bank is the person who has all the records. Um, the next important factor enabling banks to create new money, to create bank deposits from money that didn't previously exist, is the fact that banks are exempt from the client money rules. And the client money rules are important because they require non-bank organisations to keep clients' money separate from their own money, um, from their own assets and liabilities and their balance sheet. Uh, so, for example, if you um, sell a house, uh, your solicitor will receive money from the purchasers of the house. The solicitor will need to keep the money in a client account um, so that if the solicitor were to fail, you would still get your money uh, for selling the house because the solicitor was required to keep the money that you receive in a separate account, the client account, from their own bank account. So the solicitor can fail, can go bankrupt, but you should still get your money. The same is true of a stockbroker. If you sell shares, the stockbroker will receive money 
from the purchaser of those shares and will keep that money in a client account until it is received by the um, by you and again that means that if the stockbroker failed uh, if they went bankrupt then the client accounts are separate from the stockbroker's own bank accounts and so you would receive your money from the share sale despite the stockbroker going bankrupt so that's an important protection for customers that deal with non-bank organizations the client money rules require clients money to be kept separate from the organization um, that's receiving the money um, however banks are exempt from the client money rules and that exemption enables the bank to re rename their account payable liability as a customer deposit despite the money never having been deposited by a customer of the bank um, and that exemption from the client money rules means that when a customer deposits money at their bank the customer no longer owns the money and becomes a general creditor of the bank and my article on the economics network credit creation theory of banking presents the um, accounting entries associated with any organization agreeing a loan with a borrower so on the asset side of the organization that is lending on the asset side it has a, a loan an asset of 10 pounds the customer owes it money and should repay the money to the bank so that or other organizations so that is an asset on the liabilities side they now the, have a liability to the borrower to pay them ten pounds so that is an account payable because um, they owe this person money and they have to acquire that from somewhere out of their own reserves or by borrowing the money themselves uh, which would be another transaction in, in the company's accounts um, now all organizations whether banks or non-banks have that uh, those accounting entries the loan of 10 pounds on the asset side of the balance sheet and an account payable of 10 pounds on the liabilities side what is special about banks is because their exemption from the client money rules enable them to change an account payable of 10 pounds into a customer deposit of 10 pounds despite no money having been paid by a depositor into the bank account it is new money so I've discussed the process by which banks create new deposits and new money then the question is what motivates the banks to create new money why do they choose to create money out of thin air um, at the stroke of a banker's pen by placing dig digits into a computer system uh, placing numbers into a computer system uh, and the answer is seniorage and basically seniorage refers traditionally to the profit received by the state or more usually the central bank from creating new money and is calculated as the difference between the cost of producing physical money and the purchasing power of the newly created money in the economy for example if the Bank of England produces a £10 note that £10 note can purchase £10 worth of products in the economy however that money that ten pound note only cost a few pence to produce let's assume that the ten pound note costs five pence to produce and it can produce it, it is worth it can buy ten pounds worth of products then seniorage is the difference between the cost of producing the note 5p 
and the value of products that can be purchased with it, which is £10, or the senior arge in that example would be £9.95. Um, so the state acquires state senior arge. But given that commercial banks create the majority of money in an economy, we can also calculate commercial bank senior arge acquired from bank credit creation. And McFarlane, Ryan Collins, Berg and Nielsen and McCann calculated in their journal article from 2017, which is uh, the hyperlink is at the bottom of the uh, uh, PowerPoint slide, estimated the commercial bank senior arge uh, from credit creation um, as a consequence of having a lower cost of capital generated com commercial banks an annual 23 billion of additional profit per annum during the period 1998 to 2016. So private commercial banks, by being able to create money, had a much lower cost of capital. Because the cost of capital when they create a deposit in a customer's bank account is simply the interest paid on depositor accounts at the bank. And you are probably aware from your own bank statements that any deposits at a bank get an extremely low rate of interest, if any at all. And so banks are paying a low rate of interest on money deposited at the bank. Whereas if the bank had had to borrow the money to lend out from commercial debt markets, it would have had to pay out uh, a much higher rate of interest to commercial debt markets. An alternative is that it could have issued equity, share, share capital, but again the uh, shareholders would have expected at least a rate of return that, um, was, uh, that, that is equivalent to the rate of interest that would have been received in debt markets. So banks would have had a much higher cost of capital if they'd had to um, borrow the money they had loaned to customers in commercial debt markets because they hadn't had to use those debt markets because they've been able to create bank deposits. Then they've got a much lower cost of capital and so have been able to generate significant additional profits per annum. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in, in the article, it mentions it calculates £23 billion of additional profit per annum to the banks from creation of new money. So, banks have not been granted a license to print money. However, they are exempt from the client money rules. And banking regulations have been reduced uh, during the 1980s, which enabled banks to adapt custom and practice within the banking system, enabling them to create new credit money, which is to all intents and purposes money, and creates new purchasing power in the economy. And the next part of the lecture will consider the quanti theory of credit, which suggests that the purpose to which the new money is put will be extremely important in determining economic outcomes.